Nothing freaks out new PC builders more than the idea of overclocking their CPU. The thought of burning up their brand new hardware for the sake of overclocking is just too much for some to bear. But I mean, honestly, what is the worst that could happen? Yes, I know I've used that analogy before, but I think it still applies. The Mastercase 5 and Mastercase 5 Pro from Cooler Master combines modularity with creativity, giving you the freedom to build it your way. Make it yours by clicking the link down in the description. Back in the day, even the most veteran of builders would start to freak out a little bit when it came to the idea of pushing their hardware as far as they can through overclocking. Motherboard manufacturers weren't making this very easy. A lot of the times the BIOS were hard to navigate and the settings were very cryptic and you just quite honestly didn't know what they mean. But with the inclusion of UEFI BIOS and being a lot easier to navigate through the different settings and even have help menus right on the side of the BIOS, it's easier to determine what does what. And the manufacturers of motherboards have come a long way at even making motherboards designed specifically for overclocking. Now today we're gonna to take a look at three methods of overclocking to see which is right for you and just how much you really will gain. Now the first method we're gonna look at today is XMP profile. This is actually on your memory, where by turning on the XMP profile, the memory is gonna ramp itself up, it's gonna overclock itself, as well as usually putting a mild overclock on the CPU as well. And the reason why this tends to happen is it modifies a lot of the B clock settings when it comes to your motherboard. Now of course, something you need to be aware of is it's going to vary by manufacturer of memory. It's also going to depend on the XMP profile of the memory as well as the CPU and motherboard chipset that you're using. So those perimeters are all gonna have some factor here on how far the overclock is actually gonna go. Now method number two we're gonna look at is the automatic overclocking where the manufacturer has tested tons and tons of different CPUs for the current chipset or the chipset that you're currently looking at. In this case today we'll be using X99 where they determine that based on the CPU you have installed, what a safe overclock range is going to be. Typically, these are gonna be very mid-range, where there's more headroom if you move over to number three, which is going to be manual overclocking, but it's gonna be much more safe, less blue screens, less heat, and less wear and tear on your CPU. Now that moves us on to method number three, which is manual overclocking, which can take a lot of time and energy to get set where you're 100% stable. Usually the goal here is gonna to be to get as much performance as we can out of our CPU, and more often than not, setting it right on the edge of stable or pushing it even a couple of megahertz farther could lead to blue screens, random crashes, and just an overall terrible experience. But just like photography, if you like to shoot in full manual mode, then you would be the kind of person who would probably also enjoy full manual overclocking. I know I do. Now, before you do this yourself, you need to keep in mind that cooling is the most important factor when it comes to overclocking. Most of the time you have to add more voltage to get higher stability inside of the higher frequency ranges that you're going to be playing with, which means you're going to be pumping more heat into that CPU. And heat is the number one killer of Southern Californians. No, actually, it's actually the number one killer of CPUs, but the same thing here in Southern California. Somebody please put a heat sink on this damn state. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and turn around and transition into the CPU, and let's go ahead and see just how far we're gonna get with the three different methods of overclocking. We're first gonna do a base run at 100% stock, everything just completely defaulted on the BIOS to see what our baseline runs are, and then we'll see how much we actually get with those three different methods of overclocking. <sighs> I've been, I believe it or not, I've never actually done this test where we see just how far you're really going. Of course, remember, your mileage may vary when it comes to CPUs, RAM types, and chipsets, and cooling. All right, enough. Let's do it. Now remember, we are completely stock right here, so we are going to ahead, go ahead and run the CPU test, get our baseline number, and then start doing our overclocks and see what we're gonna get here. Look at them 16 boxes of goodness just floating around right there. That's, that's pretty, I like. I wish there were more boxes though. All right, so our baseline number here, and you guys feel free to play along at home and compare your numbers and tell me if yours are better than mine. I would love it uh, if somebody out there is just like, Jay, your computer is slow as fuck and mine is faster than yours. So please tell me, I would love to hear uh, about your systems. Anyway, we have got a 1330, 1330 here on our baseline test. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to save this benchmark score, reboot into my BIOS, 
and I'm going to load XMP profile to see uh, how much we improve from there. That's uh, kind of like the easiest, quickest overclock XMP profile and see what we uh, can get. Now remember, your BIOS is going to be different than mine. You're going to have to figure out which one you need for you or what you know settings you need to change for your uh, motherboard. I, I, this is not a guide on how to do this for yours. And we're going to advanced frequency here. Um, extreme memory profile, XMP, we're gonna go profile one, which bumps that up to three. 1,000 megahertz on the RAM. I thought it had 2,800 RAM. RAM. Apparently I have 3,000. Isn't it sad that I don't even know what I have? System multiplayer it goes automatic. And it is going to be bumping our CPU up from 3 gigahertz uh, up to 3.75 gigahertz. And the reason why it did that was it changed our B clock value, our host clock, from 100 to 125. So that's how it actually achieved the overclock for the, pro for the RAM, which also is affecting the CPU. It affects everything together. So the multiplier didn't change. It just upped the B clock to 125. So there you go. Let's go ahead and reboot this into, uh, again, Windows. We're gonna run the test again and see how far we actually improved. All right, so our new score here was a 1495. It's going to divide that by the 1330. That is a 12.4% increase over uh, the base settings on the CPU. Not bad, not bad. All right, so in my motherboard's case right here, it's got a CPU upgrade dropdown and all three CPUs for X99 are represented, 5820K, 5930K, and 5960X. And it has three settings for each one, a 3.8, a 4.0, and a 4.3 one touch overclock. So I'm gonna do the 4.3 and uh, I'm gonna leave the memory right here at disabled and system memory multiplier at auto. You could play with this also and get um, you know, a random overclock here of the system memory as well. I'm gonna leave that at disabled though, quite honestly, because the moment you touch that, it then starts to overclock the base clock as well. I just like seeing 16 of those boxes just chug away at this image right here. Ah, such a nice thing to see. Now remember, the C the, one of the reasons why I like Cinebench is it doesn't, it's just CPU. It doesn't take GPUs into account whatsoever, you know, which some of the rendering applications would. Uh, we just jumped up to a 1669 on top of the 1495. I'm gonna bust out my little calculator right here. Uh, let's see, 1669 divided by 1495. That's another 11.6% increase over the XMP profile overclock. Uh, or if we go ahead and divide that by the original number of 1330, that is a 25.4% increase by simply changing a dropdown in the BIOS. This is why overclocking is fun, people. It's like free performance as long as you have the cooling uh, necessary for it. And in fact, that one touch dropdown isn't really gonna even change the cooling that much whatsoever. The voltage doesn't change to a very big number where you could use an H100 or something and be just fine with that. All right, so the next one here is going to take a little bit of time um, before we are able to actually get the uh, overclocks stable here. I have to do my max overclock testing and then I'll come back and show you how far we actually got by doing things that way. Okay, so enough time and tinkering has gone by where I have settled on a 4.5 gigahertz overclock on my 5960X. That's actually a 1.5 gigahertz overclock above the base clock of the, the 5960X. Now, I wanna point something out. I could get 4.6 all day long on my EBGA X99 classified board, but for some reason on the gigabyte board, I cannot get 4.6 gigab uh, gigahertz stable. Don't know what it is. I just don't have the time to tinker with it. Uh, but I've also settled on 2666 on the memory. Now you'll know you, you typically cannot get the max memory XMP profile speeds uh, while overclocking the CPU as far as it can possibly go to. It's a bit of a trade-off, but I'd rather have faster CPU than faster RAM. With that said, let's go ahead and run the test and see just how far it's actually come. Before the test finishes here, the last one with the one touch overclock uh, was a 1669. And by only doing 200 additional megahertz and bumping up the memory speed a little bit, our speed has increased to a 1748. That's a 4.7% increase over the one touch overclock uh, that we did prior to that with the 1669. But our total percentage increase over the original 1330 
is a 31.4% improvement in Cinebench scores, and you can see them represented by the orange stripes right there. That's a 31.4% increase over just putting the CPU in and letting the turbo clock of 3.3 gigahertz do its thing. If you are putting in nice chipsets with any sort of K-SKU processor whatsoever, or even AMD FX Black Edition stuff, if you're not overclocking, you are missing out on some serious free upgrades when it comes to the performance of your PC. Now, one thing I wanna mention is that I personally don't find the additional 4.7% of increase in the amount of time it spent to find that stable 4.5 gigahertz, which quite honestly took way more effort than it really should have because uh, it comes down to the silicon lottery. Some of you won't even achieve close to those numbers. Some of you will be achieving much higher numbers with a lot, lot less effort. But you gotta ask yourself if that's worth it to you, the additional 4.7%, for the sake of tinkering. Guys like me find the tinkering to be the fun aspect portion of this whole thing. Some of you might just want to set it and forget it, which is exactly what you know new motherboards and stuff like this are offering. So honestly, it really comes down to the amount of risk you're willing to take, the amount of tinkering you want to do, and quite honestly, you aren't taking much of a risk at all by using any of the built-in overclocking features inside of your motherboards and your CPUs. You quite honestly should be tapping into this extra power. It's at your fingertips, and if you have the cooling to support it, some sort of a high-end air cooler or an all-in-one water cooling loop is even going to be uh, beneficial when it comes to these one-touch overclocks. It doesn't touch the voltage a whole lot to achieve those numbers. Remember, these manufacturer companies are dealing with tons and tons of data with lots and lots of CPUs that they've done testing with during the actual development process. I believe ASUS actually gave me a statistic of a thousand CPUs are tested when they do their overclocking uh, suites to determine what's a safe number for it to play around with. It knows where it's safe. Let it do it. Overclock your PC. And what's the worst that can happen? Well, you just have to clear your CMOS and start all over or forget it if it wasn't for you. The chances of actually ruining something are very, very slim and the chances of getting more performance definitely outweigh the slim amount of risk that you would be taking. Anyway, guys, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Let me know if your numbers are beating mine. It probably won't be that hard. I'm still really disappointed that I can't get 4.6 stable out of my gigabyte setup when I was doing it all day long with the EVGA. It's possible too that there's been a little bit of CPU degradation over time. One of the biggest effects of overclocking long-term is that you'll start to require more voltage and get lesser speed out of it as some of the uh, as some of the transistors and things start to die and, and some of your degradation inside your CPU happens. But don't let that scare you. That's a, an extreme, extreme case. I've been running my CPU at its max stable that I possibly could as long as I've had it from day one. Most people don't do that. Anyway, guys, time to get out of here. Hope you've enjoyed today's video. As always, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.